There we go. I Love Cinema, episode 31. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Whew, I made it. I'm, I'm sort of on time. And I was like, we're roughly a minute late, but there we go. Um, we are back to kind of normal. Um, hello, everybody joining. Um, I'm just going to be talking about the movie news, as I usually do. Then I'm going to be reviewing a bunch of films. And if you're catching this later on, this is for everyone later on on, on YouTube or wherever you're watching. Well, ideally on YouTube. Um, I'm going to put like an overview of all the films that I'm talking about um, with the time codes on there. So if you're looking for a particular time, uh, if you're looking for a particular movie, then you can just like fast forward to whichever one is of interest to you. But if you're watching live and that is great, if you do, thank you very much. Then uh, you're just stuck with me for the next hour. And yes, I will actually try and get through it in an hour. I'm not going to do this craziness from the London Film Festival where I had shows that were running for two hours. So thanks for bearing with us and thanks for bearing with me from last week. I uh, just was not in the right uh, set of mind and in the right position to do a show. But here we are again. And it's cold and we're in London. So cup of tea is an absolute must. So we're back with... The movie news, which I'm going to be going into in a second. Uh, the film reviews and then the Blu-ray and DVD releases are back as well as what's new on Netflix. So all the usual shenanigans. Now, first things first. Um, it's not really much of movie news there. It's more of a, like a slash TV kind of a thing. But Breaking Bad might be getting a movie. Hey Dan, how are you doing? I'm just talking about some movie news from the last week or two. Um, so Breaking Bad might be getting a movie, but it's really just pretty much a rumor at the moment. So uh, the word broke this week, earlier this week, that Breaking Bad movie might be in the works uh, with series creator Vince Gilligan apparently set to write and potentially direct. Um, and that's pretty much all that we were told. That's that's the news. Like there is no further information. Is, is this going to be like a cinema release? Is it a TV movie? Oh, hey, how are you doing, mate? Thank you very much for watching. Um, so we're not sure if this, if it's happening. If it is happening, is it going to be a cinema release? Is it going to be a TV movie, considering it's based on a TV show? I have no idea. No one really knows why they feel like they need to make a movie. We're not entirely sure. When I say we, I mean me and all my other personalities. I think the the TV series ended really well, had a great ending, it wrapped it up really nicely. There's no need for, for a movie really, so I'm not sure whether this is just a hoax or something. We also obviously don't know if Brian Cranston and Aaron Paul are going to be reprising their roles or what the hell is going on. But one of the big tidbits that uh, dropped this week was it looks like there's a Breaking Bad movie in the works, so here you go. So at the moment I would just say it's pretty much a rumor, but I thought I'd let you know. And the other one that's been a rumor for a while was Austin Powers. Obviously, there have been three films, and apparently you guys didn't like that because all my viewers just went to zero. Um, three Austin Powers films have been made. I think the last one was 2000, uh, the Goldfinger one, which obviously is also not the best one. Hey there, FRM band, how are you doing? From band? Is that what it means? From band? Anyway, hi. Um... So Mike Myers is teasing a potential fourth Austin Power movie. And apparently it's not going to be a proper Austin Power movie, as you might expect. It's going to be a potential Dr. Evil movie. So Myers was talking to Entertainment Tonight because obviously he's doing a lot of press for uh, Bohemian uh, Rhapsody and stuff. And he's interested in, hey there, Bryce Stark, Bry Stark, 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 as in like Game of Thrones Starks. Um, he's interested in making another Austin Powers movie, but this time told from the perspective of Dr. Evil. And that already had me really excited because I like Dr. Evil because he's evil. I, I have a thing for the villains. Um, so apparently he said to Entertainment Tonight, I would love to do a movie from Dr. Evil's perspective. So it would be Dr. Evil 1 slash Austin Powers 4 um, is how I, how I would roll. And then he just went, start the campaign and please and thank you. Um, so that sounds really interesting because obviously we've already had three Austin Power movies. Whether there's much story to tell for uh, Austin Powers or from Austin Powers' um, point of view, if he can come up with something. But turning it around, 
and telling the story, hopefully a different story and not just the same story we've seen. Or maybe that could even be interesting if you could kind of like retell the story of the first Austin Powers, but from Dr. Evil's perspective or something. Yeah, I'm definitely down with that because we usually don't really um, highlight the villains as much. Um, it's usually, you know, it's about all about the heroes. But even villains think that they're the heroes in their own story. So I think that could be quite interesting. So if that's being made, first of all, I want to be part of it. Hi, Mike. Come hey. And second of all, yeah, I would love to, to watch that because I like the Austin Powers films. Obviously, uh, the third one's not that great, but I really like one and two. So I would quite like to see um, like a new iteration. Plus, it's been almost 20 years since we've had an Austin Powers film. So I think that could be interesting. In other sequel news, The Hitman's Bodyguard, which came out, I think it was last year, wasn't it? Feels like last year. Um, is the, this, they're getting a sequel. This is actually officially happening. It's been sort of like a rumor uh, the last few months, but it's now official. Lionsgate has officially greenlit a sequel to The Hitman's Bodyguard. And apparently it's titled The Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard. <laughs> Just to make it so much nice. The Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard. And returning... Sorry, mate, I can't come to the door right now. Returning are all of the titular characters, so we have the original cast members coming back, Ryan Reynolds, we've got Samuel L. Jackson coming back, we've got Salma Hayek coming back, who is obviously the titular character, Hitman's wife, which was played by Salma Hayek, and the bodyguard was Ryan Reynolds, uh, so obviously the Hitman was Samuel L. Jackson, and I love this entire thing with Samuel L. Jackson and Salma Hayek. Um, their relationship, their characters, they were just so interesting. And I think without them, I wouldn't have had as much fun um, with the Hitman's Bodyguard as I did. So I really can't wait to see not just them, but especially her more highlighted in a sequel. Uh, because I think the most laughs I had in the film was with Selma Hayek. Her character was just fantastic. Like for most of the film, was it even for most of it? Or was it all of it? She was in prison basically, and it's just she was such a scene stealer. I think if you go back, if, do I have it on YouTube? Well, I definitely reviewed that for I Love Cinema. I'm not sure if I've uploaded it to YouTube, but I'm also going to put out all the I Love Cinema previous episodes onto um like as an audio podcast to make it easier like you don't need to watch my mug telling you about things you can just listen to what i have to say uh which i still really appreciate so thank you very much but yeah i really really dug uh some hayek in it and um ryan reynolds and obviously samuel L. jackson they were really good and it was kind of fun and stuff but she was kind of like the cherry on top so i'm really excited for this sequel and uh, apparently the sequel will follow reynolds bodyguard who was called Michael Bryce, and he's enlisted by Jackson and Hayek's character, so the, the couple, on a mission along the Amalfi Coast. And the Amalfi Coast is beautiful, so that's going to be amazing scenery. Um, so all of this is thanks to an interview at Variety, or is according to Variety. And um, we've got the same director coming back, the same script writers coming back, so all of that sounds really, really good. Um, if you liked The Hitman's Bodyguard, it sounds like we're going to like the sequel as well, because the same people are making it, so what's not to love, right? Production is expected to start in March, and I'm really excited for that one, because I remember I, I went to see it, and I didn't really expect much, and I didn't... I think I hadn't seen the trailer or something. I didn't know that Selma Hayek was in it. And then I was watching it and I was like, yeah, it's all right. You know, it's a decent, decent action flick. It's kind of funny and Samuel L. Jackson is in, so it is usually kind of funny. And then Selma Hayek showed up and just totally stole the show. And I'm a huge fan of hers anyway. And I was like, all right, this was definitely the right choice to make. Um, so, oh, by the way, let me just quickly check something. Let's just see. Oh, I don't know. It looks like, so I'm just seeing that this is obviously flipped, but no, it's right on, on the replay. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, I don't know. It's, it's just, I literally just came in, typed down a bunch of things for like five minutes, let my flatmate in because he needed to do something and who is the person who just barged into the door. Um, and then I was like, now I have to go live. So it's just one of them things, right? But back to news, more sequel news. Everything seems to be sequels, sequels or prequels today. Do you all remember Gladiator, right? 
Russell Crowe, this, you know, Maximus, the gladiator, killing Joaquin Phoenix and all of that stuff. Apparently, there's going to be a sequel. That, now, they've been talking about the sequel for ages. I can't remember when the original um, Gladiator came out, but it was like the noughties, I think. Um, and Ridley Scott directed it, and it's an Oscar-winning film and all of that stuff. They're now, with Ridley Scott, finally moving forward with the sequel. Now, obviously, you're like, sequel? Russell Crowe died at the end, so what the heck is the sequel about? Now, it looks like, according to Deadline, they were talking about, um, they were talking with Ridley Scott, and he was basically saying that even though Maximus died at the end, so obviously the sequel will focus on new characters. And according to Deadline, Gladiator 2 will follow the continuing story of Lucius. And if you remember, Lucius is the son of Lucilla, who was played by Connie Nielsen in the original. Um, so he was sort of the nephew to Commodus, which was the crazy uh, emperor dude played by Joaquin Phoenix, who murdered his own dad to become emperor. And who was then killed at the very end. Schurkenwolf. Hello. You sound very German. Welcome, welcome. I'm just talking about a potential Gladiator sequel to be directed by Ridley Scott. And uh, it looks like um, it's going to be about Lucius. We don't really know much about Lucius other than he was nephew of Commodus. Um, and uh, yeah, obviously Maximus died. So it's going to be showing us Rome kind of like evolving <laughs> yeah of course I noticed the German part I'm German as well that's probably why I noticed the German part Schockenwolf. Um I love it it's really cool um, and uh, yeah so it's going to be about Lucius and showing how he evolved how Rome evolved after obviously Commodus was killed in the arena by Maximus um, and then to, we, it remains to be seen whether Lucius is going to be a good guy or a bad guy I mean is he going to be more like maybe his mother, um, and, or is he going to be more like Commodus, his his uncle, um, who was obviously a crazy weirdo. So it looks like this is going ahead. Ridley Scott seems to be set to direct it, so it's going to be interesting. I love the original Gladiator. I still remember what that looked like watching it on the big screen, um, just like the, the way it opened and everything. And obviously, it I think it made Russell Crowe a household name that... Like, that made him a star, wasn't it? He he was kind of around before, but that was kind of like his big thing. And it's a great movie to begin with. Um, and then in uh, now not sequel news, now we're going into prequel news. The new Suspiria film uh, is coming out here in the UK, I think in, in a week or two. What's the... November 16th. So it's in roughly a week. Friday next week. Um, so that's uh, the new Suspiria, kind of like a remake by Luca Guadagino, um, which is a remake of Argento's Suspiria from the 70s, 70s, 80s, I think 70s. I'd seen it at the London Film Festival a few weeks ago. And if you follow me on Instagram, um, you've probably seen it in my Instagram stories because I, like, I uploaded these, like, the images and then, like, a quick 140 character blurb. Yeah, if you follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you've probably seen it, what I thought of the film. So I'm not really going to go into that. It didn't wow me, let's just say it like that. Now, it looks like the Suspiria film that's not even been released yet properly, Guadagnino is already talking about that he wants to make a prequel next. So instead of, like, the second part, sequel part, it's not going to be sequel, it's a prequel. And apparently it's going to focus on one of the characters that Tilda Swinton played in the Suspiria film. So... It's gonna, like I said, it's coming out next Friday, and uh, the director Gu uh, Luca Guadagnino he has this idea in his head to give us a bit more of a backstory about Helena Marcos, which is one of the three characters that Tilda Swinton plays in Suspiria. Now that's that's one of the things about Suspiria. Oh, I should have maybe put the poster up because I kept forgetting it for, with my other um, live shows. But I didn't realize while I was watching it that Tilda Swinton was playing three different characters in the film. And I'm usually really good at picking people out. I was like, I can tell, like, under all this mask, prosthetics, makeup, all of that shit, I see your eyes and I know exactly who you are. Um, and it's usually a bit, um, like, distracting. But in Suspiria, for whatever reason, I did not pick up on it. Maybe it's because all the press screenings at London Film Festival, they were, like, at 8.30 and 9 in the morning, and it was just too early 
Um, so I'm not a morning person. I didn't pick up on that. I didn't pick up on Tilda. Obviously, I knew Tilda Swinton was playing Madame Blanc, which is the character she obviously is playing. She's not putting any prosthetics on for that. But she was playing Helena Marcos, who's one of the coven witches. Oh, kein, kein Grund für sie. Uh, kannst mich gern duzen. Uh, Stuttgart. Aber ich wohne jetzt in London. Um, so she was... Uh, sorry, we're talking German here because I have a German viewer, so there you go. <laughs> Um, so she was also playing Helen Marcus, who's kind of like one of the uber witches in the coven in Suspiria. She's constantly referenced. She hardly has any screen time. And I think this is why Guadagnino is thinking about making the sequel slash prequel potentially about her. And apparently this is going to be a prequel because it's set hundreds and hundreds of years in the past, like before this remake film is actually taking place. Because the remake takes place in the 70s or 80s, I think, like 1970s or 80s. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see her get more screen time. So Guadagnino was actually being interviewed by the playlist, and this is what he had to say. I have this image in my mind of Helena Marcos in, oh, <laughs> sorry, I scroll past, in solitude in the year 1212. So 1212 in Scotland or in Spain, wandering through a village and trying to find a way on how she can manipulate the women of the village. I have this image. I know she was there and I know it was six to seven hundred years before the actual storyline of this film. And so he spoke with Deadline and uh, sorry, he spoke with the playlist and he previously mentioned to Deadline, a different outlet, that at the beginning they were going to title this new Suspiria film, Suspiria Part One. But they didn't want to give the impression of something that couldn't stand alone. So they didn't want people to go, it's like, this is part one of how many? You know, it's like Lord of Rings. No one told me there was going to be three. Um, so they were interested to explore potentially the origin of Madame Blanc, which, which is the other character that Tilda Swinton plays, or Helena Marcus. Um, but also the future of Susie Banyan, who is the character played by Dakota Johnson in the film. So there's like a lot of characters that he wants to kind of like explore further. Um, and he was saying that he's interested more in like making companion pieces and not just a proper sequel. Um, and I think that's really interesting, even though I'm not much of a fan of, of his film, like it's, it's a good film. It's, it's really not bad. Like if, if my, if my reviews have made it out, uh, made it sound as if that's a bad film, then I apologize. That's not my intention. It's a decent film. And I know that a lot of people were raving about the film were loving the film. It just didn't, it didn't connect with me. Uh, it was a bit too pretentious and artsy fartsy for me. Um, but there are sequences in this film that I absolutely love that wowed me. Like I was staring at the screen literally like my jaw was on the floor and I'm like, I can't believe what I'm seeing here. And some of it like amazingly brilliant. But overall, the film for me was a bit too long. It was too pretentious and too too much focusing on ballet and dancing and stuff. And funny enough, like in the last few weeks, I've seen so many films that focus a lot on on ballet that I'm going to be talking about another film later on where it was also too much of that in there. Like I've, I've clearly found out in the last few weeks that I'm not a fan of ballet, clearly not because there were so many films that are depicting that particular type of dance. And I'm just like, I know like I, I've seen, there was one good film I've seen at London film festival called girl. And that also depicted ballet and that was done in an interesting way. So I, I kind of, I understand sort of as on the periphery, um, the, the amount of work that goes in there and how hard it is to be really good at ballet. Um, which is why everyone who's a, like a ballet dancer has such a sick body. You know, everyone is like, so like muscular from head to toe and back, but I don't like watching it. I find it really tedious and boring and I'm sorry, it's just not for me. So if you make a movie that depicts this a lot, then that's just not for me. Um, and unfortunately, Suspiria falls into that category. So that was just not for me. Um, but I, I really enjoyed the film itself and, and I wanted to know more about certain characters, the backstory and what happens next. But it just feels like the film was taking too much time 
to get to where it was trying to go. And that obviously is not like, I, I think I have ADHD and I think that's just why it doesn't really gel well with me. So unfortunately that could have been better, but I still would love to see a sequel, prequel, whatever it is, because that character of Helena Marcos was quite intriguing and interesting. The character that uh, Dakota Johnson was playing was quite intriguing. Same with uh, Tilda Swinson's Madame Blanc. I would really like to see more. Shrooken Wolf is back. Um, so I'm all for seeing a sequel to that. A sequel, prequel, whatever it's going to be. Um, and that is all that I have in the news. Your phone died. Oh my God, I hope that my phone doesn't die. Is everything plugged in? No, you, you never know. Weird shit happens when I go live. So... This is the news. Now on to the first, I think, first of five films I'm going to talk about. Boom. I'm blocking this slightly. I'm sorry. Bohemian Rhapsody. Now, you probably know what this movie is about because everyone and their dog knows what the hell Bohemian Rhapsody is, right? It's a song by Queen. It's an epic song. And if you didn't know what it was, if you've ever seen Wayne World, you really know what the hell it is, right? So... We have a movie that basically celebrates Queen, Freddie Mercury, their music, their accomplishments. It's fantastic. So according to IMDb, this is what it says. Bohemian Rhapsody is a foot stomping celebration, that's true, of Queen, their music and their extraordinary lead singer, Freddie Mercury. Freddie defied stereotypes and shattered convention to become one of the most beloved entertainers on the planet. The film traces the meteoric rise of the band through their iconic songs and revolutionary sound. They reach unparalleled success, but in an unexpected turn, Freddie, surrounded by darker influences, shuns Queen in pursuit of his solo career. Having suffered greatly without the collaboration of Queen, Freddie manages to reunite with his bandmates just in time for Life Aid, which I think was in 85. While bravely facing a recent AIDS diagnosis, Freddie leads the band in one of the greatest performances in the history of rock music. Queen cements a legacy that continues to inspire outsiders, dreamers, and music lovers to this day. Now, that kind of sums it up really well. Um, the absolute emphasis of this film is on Freddie Mercury, played by Rami Malek. If you don't know who that is, maybe you've heard of Mr. Robot. Um, he's pretty much unknown, uh, especially before Mr. Robot came out, which I think has been running for like three years now. Um, he is absolutely uncanny as Freddie Mercury. Now, I have to preface this review by saying that while I do love Queen music, I did not know much about the band. I didn't know much about Freddie Mercury. I knew who he was. I'd seen him numerous times on TV. Um, I've probably even seen this Live Aid concert. Ah, there you go. Shock and Wolf likes Mr. Robot. I've given up after season two, but it's like, I appreciate it, definitely. And Rami Malek is really fantastic. Um, oh, and he was in the video game I really like called Until Dawn. <laughs> so yeah, like random facts. Um, but he is really, really good as Freddie Mercury. Absolutely crazy how much he likes, uh, looks like him. And like I said, I didn't know much about uh, Queen or Freddie Mercury. So I learned a lot of new things about them and especially about him um so i really enjoyed this film because i felt like it brought the character of freddie mercury closer to me than it ever has been um you get to hear a lot of iconic and epic queen songs so if you're into that i think you're gonna like this film um the acting across the board is good um if not great and um, the likenesses of the three main Queen guys, uh, like, who was it? It was Freddie Mercury, Brian May, and Roger Taylor, those guys. So all the guys, that, so we have Rami Malek as Freddie Mercury, we have Gwilym Lee as Brian May, and we have Ben Hardy as Roger Taylor. And you, you don't need to see them have like this iconic hair or whatever it is to immediately recognize who the hell they're supposed to be, right? They really look like those guys did. And the film starts in the 70s, um, shortly before Freddie Mercury joins Queen. So they were like a college band or something. Um, and their lead singer, after a gig, 
decides to leave because he wants to join another band and then Freddie Mercury who's not called Freddie Mercury at that point he uh, just shows up and he's like I want to be your lead singer and they're like well who the heck are you and I think does he start I think he gives I think he sings like he does a bit of an a cappella thing if I'm not mistaken um, and they're like, well, okay, so our lead singer slash bass player just left you play bass. And he was like, no, I don't, and I don't need to. And then they find another bass player. Um, oh, I can't remember his name. Was that John Deacon? Yeah, I think that was John Deacon. And that's how they create Queen. So Freddie, Freddie joins that whatever the band was called, I can't remember. And he was like, we can't go under this name. We need something proper. And then he's like... We're going to be called Queen. And he basically just takes over this band and everyone just lets him because he has all these amazing ideas. He was such a creative virtuoso. He was just like, boom, here I am. Um, and he was originally called Farouk Bolsara. And this is one of the things that I really didn't know about him, that he was, I think, there's somewhere at the start of the film, like he works at like a luggage handler or something at Heathrow Airport. And one of his colleagues calls him a Paki. And, and I was like, I didn't even realize that Freddie Mercury was not white. And I know that might be really silly to some, but I was like, I never saw him as, um, as a person of color. I don't know why. It just never really, I'm really bad at seeing color sometimes, I know. Uh, so I was really surprised by that. And I, when his family calls him Farouk, and I'm like, really? <laughs> like, I didn't realize that. So there was a lot of new stuff in the film that I didn't know. It's obviously stuff you can easily read up on the internet, um, stuff that was probably really well known to people who were fans of the of the band. But I never really paid much attention to that. Like I listened to songs, and if I liked the song, sweet. I might remember who the musician is and I might remember what the song is called and this is how far it goes with me and like my appreciation for music like I know so much more about me uh, movies that I do about music um so it was just really nice to see Rami Malek take this over and there was also this huge emphasis that apparently Freddie Mercury had a ginormous overbite which I never ever picked up on in in all the music videos that I've seen I was just it, it just never stuck out to me and there's this big thing, like, as soon as you see Rami Malek, you're like, what the fuck's up with his teeth? Um, and it's just, it, it takes you out of it. It's like, I needed like 10, 20 minutes to just like normalize this. It's like, okay, this is what Rami Malek is going to look like as Freddie Mercury. Just get the fuck over it. But it took me a while. Um, and also because I never really realized that Freddie Mercury had a problem with an overbite and he apparently never got his teeth fixed. And I was like, really? I didn't even know. And apparently he, he was really good at singing because he had a bigger a bigger jaw or a bigger mouth because he had like two or four additional incisors or something I, and apparently that makes your mouth bigger and that's why the voice is better oh, I have no idea it was, it was something like that it's in the movie and I was like means nothing to me but if you say so good I'll just go with it and then we basically just go through their entire kind of like discography, the, 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 the entire um, best of hits or something. And it's fantastic. If you're into that music, you can just go like, well, we've had this song and that song, so we still haven't had this, we haven't had that, we haven't had that. And they're going to plug it all in there. Like all the hits are in there. It's crazy. It's like someone decided, it's like, this is my favorite Queen playlist. And then we're just going to write a movie around it. And... That is what Bohemian Rhapsody is. Now, that can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending. Like, the movie isn't perfect. It's far from it. There's a lot of problems with the film. And potentially some omissions as well. But, like I said, I didn't know Freddie Mercury very well. I didn't know much about his life. So, I, I'm really not the best person to, to say whether certain things were omitted or there was stuff that they really needed to put in there. Operation Finale. I don't know that one. Tell me more about that. I don't know which one that is. Is that was that in cinemas this year? I've not heard of that. Um, so I was just asked whether what I think of the film Operation Finale or the or Operation Final. Um, I'm not sure what that is. 
So with Bohemian Rhapsody, if you're into music, I think you're going to appreciate that film. Uh, if you like anything about Queen, Freddie Mercury, you're going to love it. There's a lot of funny stuff in there as well. The way it's written is quite, not necessarily hilarious, but there's a lot of wit and fun in the dialogue. We also have Mike Myers, who's playing Ray Foster, who's an EMI executive. So EMI was a record label. Oh, are they still a record label? I'm not actually sure. Um, and again, just like with Suspiria and Tilda Swinton, I did not pick up that that was Mike Myers. I was like, this guy looks a bit familiar, but didn't happen. Team of Secret Agents track down Nazi officer who masterminded the Holocaust. Never heard of it. What was it? Operation, Operation Finale. Finale film. Let's see. Mm -mm -mm. It's on Netflix. Somehow Netflix comes up. It's a 2018, so Operation Finale is an American historical drama directed by Chris Weitz. IMDb 6.5. Oh, I don't give a shit about ratings on IMDb because... Um, oh, Oscar Isaac, Ben Kingsley. I don't think we've had this one yet. August 29th. Melanie Laurent, really good film. Ah, premise, Israeli spies from the Mossad, led by Peter Malkin, work to track down and capture. I, was, I think I've seen something about this film, but we've not had it yet. There's some, like something to do with like Nazis and, P, uh, and Peter Isaac, uh, Oscar Isaac. Definitely rings a bell, but I don't think we've had it yet. Netflix. Apparently it's on Netflix. The film was released outside of the United States on the 3rd of October by Netflix. All right, cool. I didn't know that. I'm going to chuck it on Netflix. Nice one. Um, so back to Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, I think if you're interested in, in Queen, if you're interested in their music, if you're interested in Freddie Mercury, you just got to go and watch this anyway. I think as a film, I had a lot of fun with it. Um, there was a lot of stuff that I didn't know, uh, and obviously, oh, don't worry, you can interrupt. This is why I like chatting to people. Seriously, I love that. It's like, have you done this? Have you seen this? Ideally, obviously, I want to talk about the film that I'm currently talking about, but I love it when people just throw things at me. Seriously, don't apologize for that. And I like talking about movies. Plus, I think this was actually a film that I wanted to see anyway. Somehow this rings a bell, but the title just... It didn't spark anything in my head. But then I'm also getting old, so you never know. Um, so yeah, don't ever apologize. And thank you for watching anyway. Um, but I really liked Bohemian Rhapsody because it was... It's it's kind of like a feel-good movie, even though, of course, like it's not really a spoiler when I tell you that Freddie Mercury, of course, fucking dies because he did. You know, he died in 91 because uh, of... I think because of AIDS, didn't he? Um... Or oh, maybe he, he got sick because his immune system got fucked over by AIDS, which is what it does, right? Um, and he was one of the first celebrities or, or high-profile personalities that were suffering from the disease. And I think because of that, it is, that helped give it a lot of momentum in trying to fight AIDS. And, um, oh, thank you very much, Schokenwolf. Um, and he was... Uh, and, and, I mean, now we, we have kind of like a handle on AIDS that we didn't have 30 years ago. You know, it was a horrendous, horrendous disease. It still is a horrendous disease. But nowadays, people can live with it. Um, back then, people just fucking died from it like crazy. Uh, and he was one of them. So you can kind of say, like, him dying from it had a positive effect, I hope. But this is more about... Um, celebrating Queen and their accomplishments and celebrating uh, Freddie Mercury and his accomplishments with the band and what he did for music and I just love how they because Queen had such different like they, they, they dipped into different genres for every single one of their albums like their sound changed all the bloody time and the film talks about this and I think takes it into a bit of a very extreme idea of well we should try this. Bam, 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 bam. Okay, let's just do this. And how, for example, the title uh, song, how that came about, it feels a bit overly stylized and ridiculous. If that actually happened like that, that would be a bit weird. But it's just 
made in a very funny way and and you get the feeling that Freddie Mercury was a very driven person he knew what he wanted and he knew what he wanted to achieve and the film kind of made me feel as if he felt like he was it was urgent you know like he didn't have all the time in the world to get all of the shit done and he needed to get all of this stuff out there and create all the stuff that he wanted to create and for you as a viewer obviously it's really it's so obvious that this is going on because you know that he died in 91 and for him obviously he doesn't know but so all of that really worked for me but certain things felt a bit it, it is a biopic so it's very checklisty so we have to include this event and this and this and then obviously this song is really important we have to talk about the creation of this song and why they did this and some of it is just so over the top simplified and ludicrous that I was kind of in my head, I was like, was that really how this happens? Because this is just too ridiculously entertaining to actually be true. But as a film, it worked. If we, if you consider it to not just be your usual dry, historically accurate biopic, but more like a, a legendary retelling of the milestones of Freddie Mercury's life and especially the life of the band Queen then I think it works because there were certain things that th this could be a really like like an Oscar worthy pick if they had delved more into the problems that he had with his cultural heritage um, with his sexuality with him contracting AIDS all of these things are in the film but they feel like they're more on the periphery than anything else uh, maybe because they wanted to make a feel-good picture and not make people cry their eyes out, which I still did because it's just like so fucking powerful. But overall, this is more of a positive experience. It's definitely uplifting, even though there will be moments where you probably cry. I mean, I'm I'm just like, I'm someone who just cries at everything. But I was an absolute mess by the time that this film was over. And I watched the entire credits because obviously the music's fantastic. And by the time the credits ended, I went to the bathroom and I still looked like a fucking mess. That's just how affected I was by the film. So I loved it. My initial response was I wish the film had been longer. And I think the film is over two hours long. It's not very short. Um, so it's, it's not a short film. There's a lot of stuff in there. And still I felt like I want more. I want to see more of that. It's also because Rami Malek is so uncanny as Freddie Mercury. Um, like I said, I don't know that much about the band and their live performances, but there's a lot of live performances that are being depicted in the film. And it feels like, I assume they must have looked back at them and just choreographed the shit out of it. And everything is obviously lip sync, so you actually hear Freddie Mercury sing, not Rami Malek. And it just works. It really works. Like, not all the time. Obviously, sometimes you can tell it's like, oh, he's just lip syncing to stuff. Um, yeah, exactly. Rami is also, um, Egyptian. Is that Asian Oriental? How do you say? I'm not sure, but yeah, he's definitely, Rami Malik is not a white guy. So he, um, they definitely got someone with, uh, he's a person of color. He has, has a colored background. So he, they got him to play him. So I think that works really well. It, that maybe that's why it's so uncanny. When he, especially later on when you see him playing Freddie Mercury with the mustache. And I remember seeing Freddie Mercury on TV with that mustache. And I was like, God, this guy looks so gay. Um, and then just seeing Rami Malek. And I was like, it's so hard to see. Is that Rami or is that Freddie? It's just weird. It's Yeah, it's scary almost. It's really like he is so perfectly cast in this. And sometimes throughout the film, I wish that maybe they'd gone more for the dramatic stuff of it to really delve into him having these problems with his cultural heritage and his identity because he changes his name from Farouk to Freddy um, and his dad has huge problems with that. It's like, why are you negating where you're coming from and stuff? Um, and then when he basically realizes that, like, that, that he is a homosexual, that's not fully explored either that's just not even half explored it's just like superficial it's part of it because that was part of him as a person 
So if they omitted that in the film, there would be a huge outcry. But you feel like they could have made such an interesting character piece if if they'd included that, what, what might have gone through his mind, how he was kind of like averse to calling himself a homosexual until very late in his life. But then on the other hand, this was the 80s. Like, even in the 90s, you wouldn't want to come out as a homosexual. It's like, does no one remember how horrendous that was? Like, even now, it's not that great to come out as gay. But the 80s and the 90s, you wouldn't want to come out as gay. That, that would have fucking tanked your career. Um, and it sometimes still does today. So I, I totally understand why he wasn't just really out loud and proud with that as much um, th throughout his life. He only did it later on. Um, but I, I like that singer who directed it, Brian Singer directed it. I like that he included that, that this was not omitted. This was openly talked about. Um, and I, I, I just loved it. I, I can understand why people are having a bit of a problem with the film because there are certain things that it just doesn't depict or doesn't depict in a lot of, uh, like in a meaningful way. It's just like skimming the surface. But I felt like the film is more interested in celebrating Freddie Mercury and Queen and their songs and their accomplishments. And it works from that point of view. I had so much fun with that. I loved the music. It was quite funny. There's also tragic and sad things in there, obviously. Um, and it's book ended by the Life Aid concert in 85, which kind of like catapulted their career even, even more. Um, and it's just such a great thing. It's like, I was, I was so, re I've, I really needed like all the discipline I had not to just, oh, you haven't seen it yet. Yeah. You got to see it. It's really, really good. I'd be surprised if you didn't like it. Um, but I really was in there every time the music was on. It's like, remember, you can't just sing with it or you can't just, you know, it's like there's other people in the cinema with you. So I'm just I'm just going to have to plug in my laptop. There we go. Um, you can't just sing at the top of your lungs or stomp with the we will rock you, which is obviously part of the film um, and a lot of other things. Uh, people would not appreciate me singing in the cinema. I know. But it's that kind of a film that it, it's just so captivating and it makes you want to just go and have fun and go and like, yeah, now we're going for it. Um, so I really loved it for that. It's not a somber biopic as you might expect, but this is, this is like the fluffy candy floss version. And there's nothing wrong with fluff or candy floss in my, from my point of view. I really enjoyed it. It's not perfect, but I had a lot of fun with it. And now this is the film that I just went to see earlier today. Oh yeah, it's white, so I'm now all orange. Woohoo! This is The Hate You Give. I hope you can see that actually, The Hate You Give, which is a film directed by George Tillman Jr. And it's based on a book. And most importantly, why I went to see it is because Amanda Stanberg is starring in it. And I think she's fantastic ever since I've seen her in the first Hunger Games. You're seeing that tonight. Okay, don't worry. I'm not spoiling anything. I never spoil anything because I hate it when people fucking spoil anything. So you can stay with me and let me know afterwards. Find me on Twitter. I hope you found this on Twitter. Um, find me on Twitter and just let me know what you thought. Because I really like to, to hear what people think of this one. Um, so what's this actually about? We have Star Carter, who is this lady here, and she's played by Mandela Stenberg. She is constantly switching. Oh, you don't use Twitter. Oh, that's rubbish. If you use Instagram, find me on Instagram. Um, so Star Carter is constantly switching between two worlds. The poor, mostly black neighborhood called Garden Heights, which is a fictional uh, neighborhood. F fictional? F fiction? Fictional? Let's go with fictional. It does not exist. Okay. Uh, Garden Heights, where she lives, and the rich, mostly white prep school, which is called Williamson Prep, where she goes to high school. Um, okay. And the uneasy balance between these two worlds is shattered when Star witnesses the fatal shooting of her childhood best friend, Khalil. Fictitious. That's the word. Fictitious. Thank you. Fictitious Garden Heights. So it's not real. Um, 
So there's this fatal shooting of her best friend Khalil at the hands of a police officer. So if you've seen the trailer for this, this is all in the trailer, so I'm not giving anything away here, right? So we have this thing where a young black man who is not armed, an unarmed, non-threatening black man is being shot by a white police officer. Now, facing pressures from all sides of the community, Star must find her voice and stand up for what's right. And it stars, like I said, Amanda Stenberg as um, Star Carter. We have Regina Hall as her mother, Lisa. We have Russell Hornsby, who plays her dad, Maverick Carter, um, who has a bit of like a, a gang background, which is also quite interesting. So he used to be a gang member and he managed to get out of it, which is something that is almost unheard of. And he actually has like a decent life with his family. Um, and she's got an older brother and she's got a younger brother. Her older brother is called Seven. She's called Star and her younger brother is called, what was it? Oh, I can't remember. I didn't write that down. That's rubbish. All I remember is Vincani. Vinc I can't remember. It means joy, whatever he's called. <laughs> and we've got KJ Apa as Chris, who is Star's boyfriend, who's a white guy that she goes to school with. And we have uh, Khalil Harris, obviously, who is the best friend who gets shot. And Common is playing Uncle Carlos, who is Star's mother lisa's brother yeah um and then we also have anthony mackey from the avengers he's playing king he's a local drug dealer and causing a lot of problems so the main gist as you've seen from the trailer is that obviously her childhood friend is gone down while he's driving a car the police officer asks him to pull over he pulls over He's outside of the car. The police officer goes back to his car to, to run the the uh, ID, the license plate. And the boy is a bit stupid and picks up something from his car, which if you've seen the trailer, you know, is a hairbrush. The police officer is further away and only sees a, an object being picked up, which he assumes is a gun. And he guns him down. And it's horrific because these are... These are scenarios that, in, especially in the last few years, have obviously been in the news repeatedly, like on an ongoing basis. And like, we, I can't even remember everyone's names. That's just how many, how many people have been killed by police in America. How many black men have been killed by police in America? Um, and there is even a section in the film where that is kind of mentioned but with no words you'll know exactly what i mean when you see it when you see it in the film is very powerful the entire film is amazingly powerful and poignant and just really important and amanda stenberg she, she does such a phenomenal job with the roles like i i can't i i i can't say enough yeah, it's a sad reality, exactly. And that's why we have to keep talking about this. And this is why films like this are so important. Because we can't ever stop talking about this until it's no longer an issue. Just like with everything else, that's an issue. We cannot stop talking about the issues until they're gone, eradicated. Um, and I think this film does this in a really beautiful, like horrifically beautiful way. Um, it's kind of like all-encompassing. It's not just about this. It also includes a lot of other things that um, that are happening, especially within the, uh, and to the black community. Now, I'm not black, so it's not really my um, it's, it's not really my thing to talk about this. Like, it's, it's, it's not my job to talk about this. But um, a scale of one to ten, I would give this a ten, and I don't really like giving tens out of ten, but. This film really floored me. Um, it's yeah, it's it's powerful. She's she is amazing. She's marvelous and 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 subtle and outrageous and just like she she's everything. She she is just so phenomenal in this role. Like I've I've been a fan of hers for quite a while now, but I think this is her best performance yet. I've never seen her do what she does in this film, and. Obviously, because of the topic and what it depicts, this is a really important film as well. And she does it justice. And a lot of other things that they talk about. There are so many scenes in there that are highlights and things that you should talk about. But I don't really want to mention them because they have the most power when you see them unfold on the screen for yourself. So I don't really want to talk about them. Um, 
there there are things in there that because I'm not black I would have never thought about um, at the very start of the film for example the father Maverick he sits down his kids all three kids and the youngest one being too tiny to understand anything but he sits his kids down and he gives them the talk which to a black person probably means something to me it didn't mean anything until I heard what is part of that talk and then you start understanding and I was like fucking shit every black parent does this to their kids talks about this to their children they will have to have to talk it's got nothing to do with sexuality or something like when you go it's like oh yeah I'm having a talk with my parents it's like oh this you know this this is how you know kids are made this is about the, bee, the honey and the bees the night before blind spotting I haven't seen blind spotting yet um it's on my list yet very similar yeah it's, it's kind of like get out and kind of like the black clansmen and stuff there are all these films that are depicting oh, oh um sorry to bother you uh yeah that's the one that I was thinking of that I've seen a few weeks ago they're all depicting what it's like to be a black man or, or to be a black person in a white man's world and until we have full equality these things need to be told and people need to be aware made aware that this shit is happening and I mean I'm I'm not I don't consider myself very woke but I was like fucking hell I did not realize that something like the talk was actually happening so he was talking to his young children who at the time were probably not even 10 years old oh you didn't like sorry to bother you I liked it but it's it chooses a very how shall we say it chooses a rather extreme and stylistic way to tell its story um, it's very extreme and over the top and I think if you don't like that the film's not for you and especially like in the third act <laughs> what they stumble across in sorry to bother you I think this is probably where a lot of for a lot of people the film just totally falls down and they're like what the fuck am I watching um, and I remember when I was watching it yeah and white voice and stuff but I mean to be fair I thought the whole white voice stuff now we're talking about sorry to bother you just in case someone's watching um, the whole thing with the white voice I thought made perfect sense to me because it's true like we have such judgment just the way someone talks to us when you hear someone's voice and yeah we do it, it, the same thing is kind of like in this film as well because she's she's talking about how she, there are two different versions of her of star the version that lives in the ghetto and the version that goes to the white prep school in the white prep school she has to talk properly because otherwise they're like oh she's the ghettoized black person um and it was kind of interesting to see that she has to do that in order to not be misjudged or just judged by the people around her just by the way that she talks and she like her body language and how she comes across people will perceive her a certain way and that's just how it works I mean that that's how it works for everybody just by the way someone comes across we have a certain idea of who they are and that is because of our own experience and our own judgments um, so I think that's that's why the white voice in sorry to bother you actually worked for me at least oh you speak German as a second language oh I speak English as a second language <laughs> um, so yeah I, I thought sorry to bother you is really interesting it was funny but also weird but I, I remember one of the things that really anno well not annoyed me that rubbed me the wrong way about sorry to bother you and that's got nothing to do with the movie itself but with the people I was watching it with most people I was watching it with were white um, because I think most film critics are white uh, and I was watching it at London Film Festival as part of press so a lot of them were white men and a lot of times throughout sorry to bother you they were laughing their asses off at things that made me uncomfortable because 
there were certain things that they like the film makes fun of a lot of things that are happening nowadays and taking it to very extreme levels the dark humor exactly um so in order to kind of bring a point across you you wrap it in in fun and hilarity and you throw it at the person because it usually is easier to digest for someone for an audience if it's wrapped in a bit of fun you know you you put the the bitter medicine in some sugar right that kind of thing and the people were laughing and were really having fun with it and I was like this is this not unsettling you the shit that you're seeing here because this is really happening not as extreme as it's depicted in the film but the shit happens and you're laughing at it and you laughing at it makes me really uncomfortable because you are clearly not paying attention because the film makes it funny but you can tell, like, just one layer underneath it all, it is disturbing because it's real. And so I was like, "You are you not getting it? Or are you just, like, you don't care? So that really kind of bothered me. Um, but back to the hate you give. So it's, it's also an uncomfortable film because of the stuff that it depicts. It depicts... A young black man being gunned down. It depicts the white police officer um, kind of like going through the motions. It's like, is he going to be suspended? Is he going to be put on murder charges or at least like um, GBH or whatever it is, right? He didn't plan on killing the, the kid, but he still fucking killed the kid, right? So there need to be repercussions there. And then there's like protests and there's this whole black community and how they're, how they're dealing with it and how they're dealing with the aftermath and the repercussions and the outcomes and all of that stuff and all of that rings really true because we've seen this happen in the last few years because it's been all over the media um and because of that this film is just so poignant and important and powerful and i love that they have this whole thing about like the cycle of violence and and the cycle of life and they talk about this quite a lot in the film and how we kind of just have to break out of this cycle um, and just be aware of what we're doing and of our actions and being aware of what other people are doing and maybe not just being our narrow-minded little selves. And there's just, like, you could write essay after essay about this film and what it depicts. It's just that important and it's just so relevant nowadays that I think everyone needs to go and watch it. Plus, the performances in this across the board are fantastic oh my god i'm gonna be running over i'm so sorry i wanted to do this all in one hour um so the performances are great it's a really important film it will make you cry well thank you very much for following uh yeah we definitely have to hook up on on instagram you need to let me know what you think of the hate you give so this is one of the best films i've seen this year and i've seen quite a few films i think i'm gonna have a problem narrowing it down into a top 10 because there were a lot of really great films coming out this year. This is something that you need to go and see. And I don't want to give too much away. Which is why I don't really want to talk about too many more details uh, in the film. Amanda Stanberg kills it. She's amazing. She's absolutely fantastic in this film. I loved it. Just for her you need to go and see this. And obviously like I said the topic is really important. And the more people watch this the better. And I think this isn't just depicting... Uh, what is happening uh, currently but it's kind of like giving you a positive message and, and, and trying to give you a way of how to get out of that um, of, of that cycle that we're in so I found that this film overall has a positive way to tell the story um, but it definitely if you um, are wary of like trigger warnings be aware that there's a lot of shit going on in this film and it's not easy to watch and it's like there are several gut punches in there and it's horrific some of the stuff that happens there and especially near the end um i was just like oh my god if the film goes there, i'm seriously gonna lose my shit now i'm not gonna tell you what it is or whether the film actually went there but overall i thought this was a really fantastic film i important that we are aware of this shit especially if you're not black you need to go and see this to even try to remotely understand what it's like and with that first man 
just quickly going into this, I know I'm a few weeks late with that one. Um, I missed it because of London Film Festival. What's this about? First Man is about the moon landing. Is about you are black. All right. Definitely. I definitely want to know what you think of The Hate You Give because you're black. Let me know. Um, so The First Man is about the moon landing, about Neil Armstrong. Uh, it depicts the uh, time frame from 1961 to 1969. 69, obviously, we landed on the moon. Uh, according to one of my mates, apparently we landed on the moon. Um, so, you know, he's one of those guys who's like, I'm not sure if that actually happened. It's directed by Damien Chazelle, who did La La Land. It stars Ryan Gosling, who was in La La Land, and I'm not a fan of La La Land. I love The First Man. I think Chazelle did a really, really good job. I love the way that he directed it. Some of the camera work is a bit weird because he likes the shaky cam a lot, which works for like the the astronaut shit. Really works. Like I, I got really claustrophobic and I almost got motion sick through, through certain bits of the film. And I thought that was on purpose, trying to bring across what it's like to actually be in these capsules to go through all the shit that they're going through. But then in some of the... Um, some of the more uh, dramatic works, especially between Ryan Gosling and Claire Foy, who plays his wife, Janet, uh, Neil Armstrong's wife, Janet, and kind of seals the film a little bit. Um, there was a lot of like shaky cam and I'm just like, dude, I understand that you want to tell me that there's a lot of shit happening between them and that they're like emotionally, you know, on edge and stuff. But I'm kind of getting a bit sick of your shaky cam. Just get a tripod already. Um, we also have Jason Clark, Kyle Chandler, Corey Stahl, Lucas Haas, and a bunch of other people in there. Pablo Schreiber's in this. Um, so Corey Stahl plays Buzz Aldrin, and Lucas Haas plays Michael Collins, who are obviously famously the other two people that went to the moon. Only Buzz Aldrin also set foot on the moon. Um, and I'm a bit of a space nut, um, so I, I love this whole thing. It's like whether we actually landed on the moon or not, whether they just shot this in the studio. I actually don't really give a shit. I want it to be true, which is why I believe that we actually went, because otherwise I'd be a bit sad about that. Um, I want us to go to Mars and I want us to, you know, conquer the universe kind of, and we come in peace in a nice way. Um, so I like this whole space travel stuff and I like the space shuttle and the Saturn rocket and just all of that. So watching this, it was like nerdy me was nerdying out. It was amazing. Obviously Ryan Gosling is a great actor. He plays Neil Armstrong really well, who's quite chilled and somber. There was a lot of stuff about the Armstrongs that I didn't know because I never really cared. You know, I just know that he was the first man on the moon. Um, I didn't really need to know about his family history and, and backstory. But all of that frames the film really nicely and intimately and makes it very, very personal. Um, and I'm not going to give anything away there uh, because you need to see this for yourself. I didn't get a chance to see it in IMAX, but I think this will probably look amazing in IMAX, especially all the space stuff. There's a lot of funny bits in there as well, but obviously it's also quite tragic because one of the things that happened during the space race in the 60s, a shitload of people died because they were experimenting. And... Some of them die in really horrific ways um, on camera, off camera. Um, so it's really just, it's kind of like a, it is a biopic that checks certain boxes. So that's obviously really important. Um, but it never feels as cold as some biopics do where you go, oh, we had to go from A to B to C to D to E so we can finally go to wh what we actually want to see. Um, I never had the feeling that that's what they were doing. It felt a lot more personal. And that is all thanks to Claire Foy, who plays uh, Janet uh, Armstrong. She kind of keeps it all grounded and, and emotional. And she's he's not really available to his family. And she kind of has to deal with two kids, three kids? I can't remember. Yeah. Bunch of kids and the husband who's not really there for her either. So she kind of has like one additional kid, you know, that joke that we sometimes make that a, a wife always has children plus one. Um, but it was just great to see the space race, to see to see it on a more personal level and also kind of like the, the sacrifices people have to make and, and the toll it takes on them and their loved ones. And they're not shying away from also showing you the dark side of the space race like 
people die, and these are people that you've gotten to know over the last half hour or hour, and that's what makes it more powerful. And then obviously, you see the moon landing. And I think they were using some archive footage from that as well, because a lot of that stuff looked very familiar. Um, and then they show the aftermath, uh, a tiny bit of that. And it's just a very interesting and somber approach to that, because it, it doesn't feel like you're watching the History Channel, but it's also not mega emotional or personal. It's kind of like a, a fine walk, like walking the fine line in between. So I really liked it. And I have to say, yeah, Claire Foy steals the show. Like, she has some of the most memorable scenes and the most memorable lines in the entire film. And this is a film that includes the line, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And still, she's got some amazingly memorable and scene-stealing lines. So Claire Foy is just a force of nature. And I didn't think that she was going to be able to kind of like steer the entire movie towards her but she actually without even trying to I'm sure because it is about Neil Armstrong but the most memorable stuff that happens in the film is with Claire Foy except for the moon landing itself so I think the film is really good it needs to be watched ideally you want to watch this in the cinema so I know this is probably near the end of the cinema run because I've not been able to watch it for like the last four weeks but if you still manage to see it somewhere in the cinema go and check it out it's definitely worth your while now this is what I've seen a few days ago Overlord is new oh what the heck did I do now I'm using open office and I've never used open office before and I'm not sure what the heck is going on now oh my god anyway I just made my one page into four pages. I have no idea how I did that, just by scrolling around. Um, Overlord, directed by Julius Avery. Out as of yesterday, I think, here in UK cinemas. And if you're a video gamer and you know Wolfenstein, this is that in a movie. It's amazing. It's great. Um, so the story is on the eve of D-Day, obviously World War II, right? On the eve of D-Day, American paratroopers are dropped behind enemy lines to carry out a mission crucial to the invasion's success. But as they approach their target, they begin to realize there's more going on in this Nazi-occupied village than a simple military operation. They find themselves fighting against supernatural forces, part of a Nazi experiment. Wolfenstein. When I saw the trailer, I was like, this is like someone finally made a good video game movie. And it is. This is literally Wolfenstein made into a movie, just a tamer version of it. It's fantastic. The cinematography is great. It looks great. Uh, the actors are fantastic. The hero, who you think is going to be the hero, is not actually the hero. It's it's just awesome. The, there's some stereotypical yet funny dialogue in there. Um, it's very stylistic and, and over the top, but everything in like a fun way. This entire film is just fun from start to finish. It's also quite gruesome and there's like a lot of like amazing looking prosthetics. Um, it's war, so there is like heads blown off, limbs blown off, people die left, right and center. There's a lot of gore. I think it has an 18 rating here in the UK and it's got that for a reason. So if you're into that kind of thing, go and check it out. It's so, so worth it. It's a great action film. It's got some obviously supernatural elements, like I said here in the synopsis. It's brilliant. Loved it from start to finish. It's not a horror movie. I know it's categorized and it's marketed as a horror movie, but this is more of a an action flick, a World War II action flick with science fiction and horror elements. So not really a horror movie, even though they're, they're using two or three stupid cheap jump scares you know where it's like <gasps> tension all the sound drops off and then all of a sudden we do a jump cut to something horrific and a loud sound so it's like <gasps> there was one time where i actually jumped in the film and i'm not going to tell you where that is but i had a lot of fun with this this is like a popcorn flick like literally it's like oh my god i can't believe the stuff that's happening there and it looks great the special effects are great um some of the dialogue is really witty. Um, I love the actors. They just totally go for it. They know what kind of film they're in. And they're just embracing it and going for it. I really had a lot of fun with that. It's so fucking funny. Um, we have Joy in a depot as Private Bounce. No, Bounce Boyce. He's a paratrooper. We've got Wyatt Russell as Cap, uh, Cap Corporal. 
Corporal? Yeah, Corporal Ford. I was like, he's not a captain. Uh, Mathilde Olivier as Chloe. See you later, Shogun Wolf. Thank you very much for watching. We'll talk about movies next time. I'm always here Thursdays, 8 p.m. Um, all right, so we've got Mathilde Olivier as Chloe. So they drop down in France because they have to take out the flak machines or something so that the planes can come in and then D-Day can commence. That's basically, this is like one of the most, if not the most vital mission in the entire uh, Allied Forces World War II stratagem thingamajig. Um, <clears throat> we have John Magaro, who you might know from Orange is the New Black. He plays Tippett. He's one of the paratroopers, and he's kind of like the comic relief. He's got this thing going on with Chloe's little brother, Paul. It's adorable and hilarious, and there's like a lot of shit happening, and there's a lot of fun happening, and then you're like, what the heck am I watching? That kind of a movie. It is wicked. It's called Overlord. Now on to... The Nutcracker and the Four Realms or something. Is that a Nutcracker and the Four Realms? I didn't really want to watch that. I heard some good things about it, which is why I ended up watching it um, before I went to see First Man. You know when you sometimes go to the cinema and two films just work perfectly? This one ends as this one starts. That's what happened, which is why I watched this. Trust me, you don't want to watch this. Like, even if you have a kid... There are other things that that kid could watch in the cinema other than this, because this is an absolute waste of time. Um, it's not great. So what's this about? So all Clara, who is this one, she's the lead. Um, what is it? Is it Mackenzie Davis? No, Mackenzie Foy. No relation to Claire Foy, apparently. Mackenzie Foy is Clara. So, sorry, I've just scrolled out of everything and I can't see anything. And I don't know open office that well. It's like, I can't. Oh my God. This. No, doesn't make it better. Okay. All Clara wants is a key. A wonderful kind key that will unlock a box that holds a priceless gift from her late mother. So her mother died. This is like the thing. She's got uh, an older sister, a younger brother. Her mother just died and her dad's around. So, and it's Christmas. So everything is like, yoo -hoo. Um... A golden thread presented to her at Godfather Drosselmeyer's annual holiday party leads her to the coveted key, which promptly disappears into a strange and mysterious parallel world. It's there that Clara encounters a soldier named Philip, a gang of mice and the regions who preside over three realms, the Land of Snowflakes by Kira Knightley, uh, who is led by Kira Knightley, the Land of Flowers, the Land of Sweets. Clara and Philip must brave the ominous fourth realm, home to the tyrant mother Ginger, played by a brilliant Helen Mirren, um, to retrieve Clara's key and hopefully return harmony to the unstable world. Now, we have all of that. So this is Madame Ginger. This is Snowflake person, Kira Knightley. And you immediately know what will happen throughout the story of this film because it is so predictable. It, I literally, I could have had a checkbook and I would have gone like, check, 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 check. Oh, now, uh, check. Nothing ever in this film will surprise you. Even Kira Knightley and Helen Mirren cannot make this film enjoyable or watchable. It is such a disastrous waste of time and waste of space. It's really, really bad. Considering Mackenzie Foy, she's kind of like cute and charming. But the plot is so stupid. Like, every five minutes I was like, why are you doing that? Why would you do that? That makes no sense. Why would anyone do that? It's like, this makes... But where did the thingy go? And was, yeah, I was just yelling inwardly, yelling at the screen every five minutes. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. Are you forgetting the scenes like five scenes ago where you had the thingy mabob and that you could use the thingy mabob right now? It angered me crazily. I'm not sure if even a three year old would enjoy this. I really don't know. Like, if someone goes and sees this with like a three or five year old, let me know if they enjoyed it. Because I can't think of anyone who would enjoy this because it's just so boring and tedious and stupid and makes no sense um and predictable you know exactly what's gonna happen and just because that then happens doesn't mean like yeah i knew what was gonna happen i knew this movie it's like no it's, it's not entertaining it's not helen mirren didn't make it work kira knightley didn't make it work i felt like i'm so sorry kira knightley that you had to play this and she has a voice like this and i don't know why she has a voice like this because in all the movies the one with the wings on the back has a voice like this. And so she has a voice like this. Why? It's just... why? Don't go and see this. Seriously. Just the short of it, the long and short of it is, just don't watch it. It's, it's a waste of time. All right. 
And that was I Love Cinema, uh, episode 31. I'm just quickly going to rant about what is new on DVD and Blu-ray. Um, so we have Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom uh, has come out, as well as Tag, and Adrift Tag, obviously the film I didn't enjoy very much, Adrift, starring Shailene Woodley, which I think is really, really good. So if you missed that in the cinema, go and check it out. First Reformed is out, which I missed in cinema, so I'm going to check it out there. And a film I watched at the London Film Festival is actually out on DVD. It's called Nancy. Um, so if you haven't seen that yet, definitely check this one out on DVD. Um, so these films have been released in the last week or two. New next week, Incredibles 2, out on Blu-ray and DVD. Check it out. It's really good. Leave No Trace is a film that uh, with uh, Ben Foster and a little girl. I missed that in cinema, so I'm going to try and get a copy of that. And if you've seen some of my London Film Festival coverage, you probably heard me talking about Bros. When the Screaming Stops. It's a documentary that unwillingly is hilariously funny like people literally laughed out loud during the screening I was at and I thought it was one of the most entertaining things I've seen in a long time um, and involuntarily so but that is out next week as well so if you want to check that out do it I don't think you're gonna regret it because it's hilarious new on Netflix uh, the light between oceans I think has been on Netflix before but it's a good movie so go and check it out obviously house of cards season six the Claire Underwood um, season is out and this is what we all need, right? We, we need the old guy to go and the new woman to step in. Um, the Good, the Bad and the Ugly is a classic. I'm only mentioning that because I saw it by accident and I'm like, this is the, I don't like Westerns, but this is one of the few Westerns I love. I think this is my absolute favorite Western film of all time. Um, if you've never seen The Good, the Bad and the Ugly, do yourself a favor jump on Netflix and go and check it out. And then last but not least, a new documentary called They'll Love Me When I'm Dead, which is one I missed at the London Film Festival. It's about uh, a documentary of the last Orson Welles film that was ever, well, he didn't finish it. But Netflix has now sorted it out and got a production company to finish this. Um, so the film is called The Other Side of the Wind. And the documentary about its restoration um, is called They'll Love Me When I'm Dead. And apparently, according to the guy who did the documentary and the restoration, um, if you watch the documentary first, before you watch the actual film, it will give you a better understanding of the film itself. Because I, um, I was talking to someone who um, went to see They'll Love Me When I'm Dead, the documentary, um, and I was like... I probably have to watch this after I watch the film because it's going to give something away. He was like, no, no, no. The guy who did this, he said you should watch the documentary first. So there you go. Watch the documentary first. So they'll love me when I'm dead. That's the documentary. Watch that first. Then go and see The Other Side of the Wind, which is the actual film. Uh, the last film by Orson Welles. Now on Netflix, both the documentary and the film. So go check it out. Um, I just realized I forgot to write down what's out in cinemas next week. But this has basically been uh, I Love Cinema for this week. So let's see what's out next week, shall, shall we? I think this, uh, The Girl in the Spiderwebs is actually coming out uh, next week. And I am so excited for that. One of my mates, um, he called me earlier. He said that he'd watched that uh, yesterday and that it was absolutely phenomenal. And he was like, Mel, I think you're going to like this one. So I'm really, really excited for that. So let's have a look. Today is the 9th. So let's see the 16th. What's out there? Oh, Fantastic Beasts comes out on the 16th. Um, and I also mentioned Suspiria coming out on the 16th. And we have a bunch of other things out as well. Just bear with me while it's loading. Um, I think Assassination Nation comes out next week as well which I've seen at London Film Festival. That's definitely a film to check out. The Grinch is out as of tomorrow, which I can't wait to see. I love The Grinch. It's hilarious. Um, so do check out The Hate You Give. Uh, check out Bohemian Rhapsody. Forget about The Nutcracker, seriously. But watch The Hate You Give. If you can still find it in the cinema somewhere, do check it out. Widows is out as well. If you want to know what I thought of Widows, just go onto the YouTube channel. Hashtag I love cinema. Oh, I didn't put that in there. Sorry. There we go. 
hashtag I love cinema. Uh, and you will come to all the videos that I've done. Uh, go for the uh, London Film Festival one and you will find the Widows uh, review that I've done. Overall, I thought Widows is a decent film. Uh, it's not as great as I thought it would be, uh, judging from what I've seen in the trailer. But it stars Viola Davis uh, and a bunch of other great people. So it's a really good movie and I think it needs to be watched. But overall, I expected it to be a bit, bit more amazing and girl powery than it actually turned out to be. Which, is a, which was a bit of a disappointment and a letdown because my expectations were too high. Um, but overall, it's still a really good movie that you need to have seen, I think. Especially if you like um, female-led films, female-driven films. If you like Viola Davis, you need to go and check that one out. And so that is Widows. So check out Widows. Check out The Hate You Give. The Grinch is out. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, Overlord, Bohemian Rhapsody. Man, there's a lot of stuff at cinema. And there's going to be more and more stuff coming out. I mean, we're approaching, what, what is it, like six weeks to Christmas? It's going to be epic, guys. I'm going to see you next Thursday, 8 p.m. I Love Cinema is going to be back. Follow me on Twitter uh, at Melanie underscore Radloff or just find I Love Cinema Vlog, all one word, on Twitter. All the information is going to be on there. Um, find me on YouTube. Subscribe to the videos on YouTube so you're not going to miss anything. Uh, but yeah, I hope you have a good time. And let me know. Oh, so hi Fabrizio. I'm sorry, but I'm at the end of my show. So come back next Thursday at 8 p.m. and I'm going to be talking a lot more about movies. Have a good weekend and see you soon. Bye.